So today I have a Panasonic SAPT770. It's a home theater surround sound system. And the customer says it just won't power up. So AC power on, and I hit the power button, and I get two clicks. We'll try it one more time. Two clicks, that's it. A third time, nothing. It only does it twice. So I have to remove AC power, wait for a moment, power it back up, power button, two clicks. That's it. Power button again. Two clicks. Never a third time. Only does it twice. So one thing I know about these units is it has a small cooling fan on the back right here. You can see the cooling fan right there. And so on this unit, when you press the power button, the first thing it does is it tries to run that fan. And if it can run the fan, it has a tachometer lead. That white lead you see back there is the tachometer lead. And it makes sure the fan is running and it will not allow this unit to power up unless the fan is actually running. So let's go ahead and get the meter out and we'll probe the red and the black leads to that cooling fan and see if we get voltage when we try to power the unit up. And that's going to tell us a lot right there. Okay, so I've got my probes on the red and the black leads back here in the cooling fan. Let's hit the button and see if we see anything. About 0 0.06 volts. Let's go ahead and put it on min-max. So let's look at the max voltage. 0 0.076 volts. Not enough to do anything. So I know that the power supply is getting the on command to turn on. And so I had one of these units in and I did not do a video on it. I probably should have. But it ended up being this power supply controller chip. The switch mode power supply controller. STRX6729. I just happen to have an extra brand new STRX6729 power supply controller IC. It's never been used. You can see the pins have never been soldered on. It's brand new. When I serviced the last one of these, I ordered a second IC just to make sure I had a spare. So let's go ahead and just throw that in there. Let's shoot the parts cannon at it and see if this takes care of it. So now to gain access to this chip, we need to pull off the front panel as well as remove this board and all the connections, all the screws right here because we have to lift this board up and out of the way because the power supply board is nested underneath this main controller board right here. So let's go ahead and pop off the front panel. It's just a bunch of snaps. So those two are done. We gotta pull this connector off right here. It's loose. I believe we have to pull this connector off. It's taped on. That one's loose as well. This one goes to the DVD. We don't have to worry about that one. There we go. The front panel is loose from the unit. Let's carefully keep it together and flip it back over to make sure we have everything loose that we need to have loose. We certainly don't want to pull any ribbon cables that we don't have to. And we do have one more regular cable that we have to unplug and then the front panel is completely loose from the unit at this point. Next we'll go ahead and pull these two screws loose. We have to pull the surround sound card out. This is the transmitter for the wireless surround sound speakers. And then we do have to unplug the fan over here. And now the back panel is free as well. I'm going to check the fan. It appears to be just fine. It's rotating freely. It bounces after I turn it. So that's a good sign. The bearings are free. Now let's go ahead and unplug the DVD mechanism right here. And then there's a large connector, as I recall, that plugs this onto the main board. We'll unplug the connector from the wireless transmitter. These connectors have to come loose right here. Then there's a couple of ribbon cables we can disconnect. And then this main microprocessor board becomes free from the unit. Now we can get to the power supply board. Let's take all the screws out. And we'll disconnect this one connector here. There's one locking tab that has to come loose right here. And so the power supply board is free. Let me take a peek at the bottom of it, see if we see anything obvious. So there are the solder connections to the power supply controller I see. They don't look totally good. I see cracks around most of them, which could be responsible for the demise of this chip. We could try to just solder it and see if that takes care of it or not. Everyone looks like it has a small crack around it. It's very hard to see on the camera, but they definitely look bad. All right, so let's just go ahead and hit these real quick.
All right, they're all resoldered. They definitely have good connection at this point. So we'll go ahead and flop the board back in it and see what happens. So now anytime you're in a situation where the power supply won't start, always look for some high value resistors because normally those go to the bootstrap circuit. And what that does, it typically charges a capacitor that allows the power supply to start for the first couple of oscillation cycles until the power supply can sustain itself. So here's a 2.2K. So I get 2.192K, that's good. This is a 33K. And I get 32 and it's charging. It's kind of leveling off at about 32.8K, I'd say. I'd call that good. Now up here, there's a couple of more 33Ks. 32.8, 32.8, those are both good. So I've had a history of these high value resistors failing, not necessarily a 2.2 or a 33K. Usually I see the ones that fail are up in the 300 to 400K range. Okay, so I have everything loosely connected. The front panel's connected, the board is in, but it's not even mounted down. The fan especially, very important that it be plugged in on this model. So let's go ahead and give it a power up. We get two clicks and no start, no fan spin. Try it one more time. Two clicks, no start. Let's go ahead and change that power supply controller I see at this point and see if that takes care of it. Just a real quick word of caution on this unit. After the power supply has not successfully started, this capacitor right here, C5712, these two terminals, will still be energized with close to 160 volts on the US model. That's 120 volts into the full wave bridge rectifier times 1.414. And so that is the peak voltage rectified and filtered. Make sure that you discharge this capacitor somehow. Now, I use my Fluke 117 in the low impedance input range, which puts a 3,300 ohm resistor across the input leads. When I did a lot of plasma TV repair, I kept with me a 10,000 ohm 5 watt resistor to discharge the power supplies and so you can just put this across the capacitor terminals and in about 20 or 30 seconds it'll be down to a safe working voltage within uh, 5 or 10 volts so just make sure that you follow safe discharge precautions on this capacitor so let's go ahead and unsolder this chip now <laughs> There, it's all unsoldered, ready to go. Now it's kind of hard to get to, but if you have a long enough screwdriver blade, you can go ahead and remove that single screw that holds it to the heat sink. And there it's completely out. And let's put the new one in. So I've got some fresh heat sink compound on the back of this one. We're just gonna smear it around a little bit. And then we'll do the same thing on the heat sink itself. The compound that's on there looks pretty good, so I think we'll be okay. There we go, it's in place. We'll just put the screw back in it now. Make sure we tighten it down, and you kind of want to see heat sink compound oozing out all the way around it. There we go, good and tight. Let's solder it back to the board now. All right, that looks really good. Let's go ahead and put it back together and see if we get favorable results. Okay, power supply board is back in. It's all screwed down. We'll go ahead and plug that connector back on right there. Next, we have two connectors underneath the main board to plug in. Now that both of those are plugged in, we can go ahead and fold the main board back down. Now there's two more connectors that need to plug in from the main board to the power supply board. Do not forget to reconnect the one connector to the surround sound circuit board for the surround sound transmitter. Now we can go ahead and put the back on the unit. Make sure the fan gets plugged in right down here and then apply this little wire to pull the fan wires away from the fan blade so they don't interfere with the rotation of the fan. Let's go ahead and put the front panel back on. First we can plug in the DVD mechanism. And then we'll plug in the three connectors for the front panel.
All ready to go, let's plug it in, see if it fires up now. All right, so let's hit the power button, take a look at the fan, see if it spins. Power on, the fan spins. The display says hello. Checking the disc. No disc. So far, a successful repair. Let's put a disc in it, hook it up to some speakers, and see if we get some audio and video out of it. So I have a disc in it there. You can see the disc is spinning. It's reading the disc. Let's get a monitor connected to it, see if we get video. All right, well, there it is working. There's my media pinball machine, which I still have to this day. And it's got audio. So the uh, DVD portion has audio, okay. Let's go ahead and connect a auxiliary input to it. And let's make sure it has radio and auxiliary input. Okay, well there's the radio input. It seems to be working just fine. And there's an auxiliary input. YouTube copyright free audio. It's playing just fine. Well, there it is, working. Power supply chip replaced. It's all good. So I hope you enjoyed this video on the Panasonic SAPT770 repair. If you did, please consider making a donation to my YouTube homepage with the PayPal donate button or at paypal.me slash NorCal715. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and ring that bell to get future notifications. Remember, with your help, we can keep these things out of the landfill and out of the recycle bin and the e-waste facility. Everybody have a great day. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.